adrenaline is an amazing thing because I can like all the colors and smells and everything is very very vivid but also the train of thought which uh, it's it's amazing what your brain can do when it's really forced to and so I remember the whole thing of like all right man what do I do here do I open the door and roll out do I elbow the guy in the face do I grab the wheel and crash and hope for the best and you know all of these things and, and really you know came to a conclusion to just placate the guy and you're gonna get a chance to get away whenever we get get to where we're going I studied philosophy when I was in college, and I generally think of myself as a very introspective person. And I'm also a very type A person. I get into something that I kind of push very hard. And as I look at my life now, I reflect back, and the times of my life where I've been happiest are actually uh, when I've been the most unbalanced. As much as I love being in Bhutan and I love the adventure, you know, I, I'm ready to be at home right now with the sun on the way. and. At the same time, I couldn't say no. And why? Because, you know, how often do you get an opportunity, you know, to be invited to a mythical, magical country to come explore and to do my favorite thing, which is to go figure things out? How do you make the whole thing work? How do you dial in the logistics? How do you figure out how to catch this fish? How do you get better? Can you get other people to do it? Can you do all those things and help the community and then help the resource? I mean, this had all the potential of all the things I love to do. So I had to come, even though the timing was less than ideal. Extremely rare, extremely rare. It's the last healthy population, we think, kind of the Shangri-La of Golden Masir. They wouldn't let us go across the river, the little stream to get a half a mile up. So they're built for surviving a big, huge river that has trees and rocks and boulders coming flying down in the middle of the monsoon season. They have an unbelievably tough skull. It's like steel. As far as angling, they're extremely powerful. When we first started, we had just commercially bought little lures that had regular trebles on them. They were like straightening like butter. So uh, the largest record of, of a Bhutan fish is 127 pounds. I mean, it could be, they could be 60, 70 years old. The, the golden masir are very revered here in Bhutan. They're both considered a royal fish. You know, they kind of belong to the royal family. The royals are charged with protecting these fish. It's also one of the eight auspicious symbols of Buddhism. Every Bhutanese knows what that fish is. Those that are near the river have stories of their grandparents, you know, basically walking across the backs of Cernia to get across the river. Being a Buddhism country is one major factor that actually keeps this fish and wildlife safe in Bhutan, the environment in intact. Even cutting a tree is a sin in Bhutan. You see the symbolism throughout the country that's painted on the side of buildings and you know it's really just everywhere. It's a big part of the culture. But the idea of going out there and playing with them is very, very taboo and foreign at the same time. It's something that I I don't know, maybe I consider him like my relatives or anything. If I catch him, I would never want him out of the river to be in the place, somebody's place. Bhutan is still one of these places where it's so remote and so hard to get to and so unpopulated and still so pristine. What you really have is an intact original environment. And I mean, it took six days to get to the river where we caught this fish. I mean, six days in today's time, man, you can get anywhere you want, but this is not, not easy. You really, you really, really, really had to work to get there. Then you do, and, and it almost feels helpless, right? I mean, there's no information, and there's bad information, and then it was days of just nothing, just thousands and thousands of cast and, and nothing. Cobra, crates, bandit crates, vipers. 
What type of vipers do you have? Tree vipers. Green they're green, vipers. bright green. green. Yeah. Light green and small. Yeah. It's very difficult to, you know, really classify between the branch and the viper actually on the tree. Yeah. They just stick like that and shoot down. They're mean. <laughs> the fish that I enjoy chasing the most, you know, they're the ones that are generally the hardest. Right? When you have to work for it, when you have to earn it. And golden masseer are going to fall in that category. I mean, we know very little about them, but they have barbels like catfish. I don't know if they don't see well, but you're fishing big water, you know, for a fish that doesn't really readily eat flies. You know, it's, this is a tough place to fish, and we have caught some, but the number of hours that you put in to get them there is, is a lot. You can see them you're right there. You expect that that, you, that first cast, they're just going to jump on it. It's never happened. When I was in college, I had, uh, had a really bad skiing accident. I broke my back, I broke three vertebrae, my pelvis, my hip, my sacrum. Uh, I missed a whole year of school, and it was a really challenging time. You know, you know, it was also the time where I really found fly fishing. There's a great part of, of fly fishing that is very methodical and a harmonic of casting. You know, we're sitting here in the land of Buddha. You know, it's, it's very very much meditational, you know, to get in this rhythm and cast. And, and that was very much part of my therapy of getting better. And it was shortly after that that I started guiding and, you know, ended up being good at it and, and loved it. And I got an opportunity to go guide in Argentina and a guy showed up who, everything was brand new, everything had the tags on. He had never fished before. And, you know, I was a young kid and guided him for the week and, you know, just hit it off. I mean, I was also at a stage in my life where I was very naive and he was a very inquisitive person, both on trying to understand fishing, but also just on me and what I was doing and, you know, what my life was going to look like. And, and Bill, you know, at the end of the week said, you know, you should come work for me in New York. And I was like, well, what do you do? And he was like, I run, I run a hedge fund. I was like, yeah. You know, and as a fishing guide, you end up with these incredible relationships with your clients and often you get offers like this and they're generally insincere. So I didn't really think much of it. And, you know, a few months later after finishing my season, there's a box at my house full of books and a letter from Bill. He just said, you know, you should, you should think about coming to New York. Why don't you read these books and give me a call? You know, it's a good test to see whether he read the books or not. And he did. And then he called me. And I said to him, if you were ever interested in what I do, um, let me know. And uh, I'll teach you how to fish, but my version of fishing. I had zero desire to be in finance. I had zero desire to be in New York. But I also understood that there was an opportunity there. You know, working for Bill Ackman at Pershing Square is it's like a pinnacle career, right? I mean, that's one of the best jobs in the world, right? People would literally kill for that opportunity. And I was the only analyst there that didn't have an MBA from an Ivy League school. Right? I mean, I would walk around with a giant legal pad and just write down words I didn't understand. It wasn't like being thrown in the deep end of the pool. It was like, you know, being taken offshore and thrown out of the boat. Early on, you know, Bill called me in his office and just asked how things were going. I was like, I'm so, so lost. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing and I'm certainly not helping and I don't understand why I'm here. But his response was like, look, everyone here is trained to think the same way and you're gonna have a different perspective. So I want you to just read and do the work and ask questions and tell us what you think and don't be shy. Well, I think the biggest challenge for him was going from, in a sense, the wild to, you know, the canyons of, of New York. 
I think that was his biggest challenge for him. And he can only take it so long. After I'd been there for a couple of years, Bill called me in his office and just said, you know, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I, I love the opportunity, but I don't think this is what I want to do with my life. I was like, you know, man, I miss being outside, right? And I miss the adventure. And if I could get back into fishing and do more than just guide and like have a real business and make a real living and do that, that would be the dream. And he said, okay, go do it. He said, you know how to value businesses. You know what they're worth. You know how businesses work. You can do it. He's like, and I'll backstop it. So I started looking and, you know, found a little piece of dirt and, you know, I made a really low ball offer. They said yes. And, you know, I called Bill and took him up on his offer. And that's how I ended up moving to the Bahamas and, and starting what became Abaco Lodge. Hold me down, hold me down, child. I didn't make the investment really to try to make money. Uh, I made the investment because I believe in Oliver and I thought good would come from this. Yeah, uh, grim, <laughs> I would say. And obviously he felt bad about that because you know I'm his partner in this fishing lodge and if I hadn't gotten involved, he wouldn't have had that uh, experience. Uh, but if I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere, in the jungle or wherever, it's kind of the guy you want to have next to you, right? So uh, he can take care of himself and you know that could have been really bad. I'm a ghost to you, you're a ghost to me, a bird's eye view, a sound Everything I had was invested, you know, I, I took every dollar I had, I put it in, and I was living there doing everything, right? Work permits and construction and really cranking, trying to get the whole thing done. I've got a crew working Monday to Friday and another crew working on the weekends. And it was a Saturday and my guys had just gotten off work, so it's like five o'clock. And I'm I had actually just washing some dishes. I look out the window and there's a guy standing there, which wasn't that unusual. And I'm pretty personal, so I just walk out. I say, hey man, what's going on? What can I do for you? And he's like, look, I'm looking for a job. It's like, look, I've got a contractor. You have to talk to him. And this guy starts just kind of walking into the property and I'm following behind him. And I was like, man, what? what's going on? It's just really weird. And I just kind of neglected the guy. And I start talking on my phone and I hang up and I turn around and the guy has a machete at my neck. He's like, listen, you don't understand. He's like, I need money right now. It's like, I got a little bit of money in the house. I turn and walk towards the house and he starts poking me with his machete. It's so just instinctively, I take off. I just run and uh, I've got a Chevy Blazer that's parked in front of my house. And I go jump in it and so I'm in the front seat trying to get the keys out of my pocket to get this thing started. And, uh, you know, he jumps in the back seat behind me, hits me in the back of the head with a machete, get out, get in a little bit of scuffle. He's like, I'm gonna kill you if you don't stop. And uh, so he ties me up to my front porch. So, and I, I'm serious, I, I was standing outside and I laughed out loud. I was just like, I cannot believe this is happening, right? I didn't really think I was in danger. I was just like, you gotta be kidding me, right? that, that this was real. And uh, he's like, all right, I'm taking you with me. I'm like, whoa, whoa, you know, that, that, that's a terrible idea. And so it's dark, we're driving, they're talking about, you know, religion and his mom and why he's in so much trouble and what's going on. And I'm sitting in the back and I'm trying to get untied. And uh, he kind of figures that out. He pulls off the road and roughs me up a little bit more and then cuts out all the seatbelts in the car and hog ties me in the back. So I go from like being kind of tied up to like being properly tied up and now I'm laying flat uh, in the back of this blazer. And we keep keep driving north for what felt like forever. It's really not that far now that I know where, where I am. Pulls off, just cuts the car off. And he just says, listen, he's like, I don't think you understand. I need money and I want you to write me a check. And I'm just like, listen, you have my wallet and all of those cards in there, we can go to the ATM and I can get you a little bit of money and then you can let me go. And He's really calm, just kind of opens my wallet, looks at all these cards, and he's like, you're lying to me, it doesn't work here. It's like, man, I promise it works everywhere in the world. And just like that, man, he gets out of the car and puts the t-shirt and the gas cap and lights it on fire with me still inside.
couldn't roll over the seat. I couldn't kick the window. I couldn't do anything, just like in the car or like watching, watching it burn. I think he got in over his head. He didn't intend to kidnap me. I think he just wanted to rob me. And then when he realized he kidnapped an American, he knew he was in trouble. And I think he wanted the car to blow up. Uh, that would have fixed it for him. And it didn't. And I don't think he quite knew what to do next. You know, I can't believe that I'm alive. And then the hatch opens and the dude's still there, right? Drags me out, kicks me a little bit. And we're in this construction site. There's a backhoe and he like undoes the hog tie part and takes that seat belt, goes over to the backhoe and makes a noose and then takes me over there and puts me in this noose. And I'm standing on my tiptoes, I'm tied up. And he's like, I'm gonna go to the ATM and if you lied to me, I'm gonna come back here and kill you. And he, he walks away, walks back to the car. And he walks back to check on me to make sure I'm not getting untied. And he does that a couple times. And then he comes back. He's like, you know, I'm taking you with me. And he takes me out of this noose and he undoes my feet. And so my hands are tied up and he puts me in the front seat of the car now. It's an island of 25,000 people. There's one stoplight and there's one main drag. And it's Junkanoo, which is like the equivalent of Bahamian Carnival. Right. There's a giant parade. There's one main drag where the bank is, and everyone on the whole island is right there. And I'm just like, oh my God, he's not gonna go to the bank. And we pull up, and, and the guy said something that I can still hear in my head, which is, he said, all these people think they're safe, but there's people like me watching them all the time. And uh, we park behind the bank, get out. I've lost my shoes by this point, I'm barefoot, a little beat up and he gives me my wallet back. It's like, I'm gonna be behind you. And I get to the corner and I don't even look back, man, I just bolt into the parade full straight, go, go against the grain the whole way, don't look back until, until I felt safe. And then I grabbed a cop and uh, that was it. That was a real, a real moment of just kind of understanding that your time is precious and you know you need to do the things that that really matter for you Some big guy just takes his fly, takes one of her fly, and yeah, that's the big my day, and everyone's day. Yeah. That from that day, I was a little worried. You know, I didn't know what to say, and yeah, I was trying to take him to all the best places. You know, all the holes that I knew we have, where we have caught fish, none of those holes have fish. Wow, I was surprised. You know, and. Uh, Every time when we didn't catch one, I was always praying, you know, oh my God, please help me out, you know. <laughs> if not, I'm going to, I'm dead, you know. I, uh. What I really appreciated and I learned a lot from him is like being patient. You know, on, when you're trying to do something, like catch a big fish, you don't rush, you don't feel sad about when you don't catch anything on the day. We see lots of fishermen, but not like Oliver. I don't think I can ever stop doing what I do, right? I mean, it's embedded very deep in, into who I am, but, uh, but I've never kind of longed so much to get home. F for me, having a son tapped into a level of emotion so that I, I didn't know existed and we had a rough start when Huck was born. We spent about the first month in the NICU, which is you know, incredibly taxing in, in pretty much every way. And 
someone told me, I, I would love to take credit for this thought uh, because I find it to be one of the most true things I've ever heard. But uh, the price you pay for for loving something so much is the risk of losing it. And it's instantaneous and it's transformative and, and it's all these things that, that parents say that really don't resonate with you and I don't think it's possible until you're there. And and then it all becomes very clear and you understand and, and, and life changes and I instantly became the guy, you know, showing off baby pictures in the bar, which I swore I would never ever do, but you just can't can't help it. It's just you know, part part of the whole whole thing, and you, and you do you transform into a dad, and it's, and it's different, and 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 it's wonderful. And mama, they're mating at night. Fish. Mama, they won't make night. Yes, Is it a golden? Yes. The face and glow and bright. The face is all snowy and white. Bury their palms. Seeing Oliver with all the smiles and laughter, wow. I mean, it's, it's like dream come true yesterday. That's beautiful. You won the trophy today. He handled that fish so well. I would have imagined if it was somebody else, we may have lost that fish. She's muscled and fine. There is one set of plans, the kind of the 20 year plan that has one to four dams on every single major river system in Bhutan. That kind of a plan would be devastating for the Masir because that really eliminates most of the spawning areas. They're very conscious and very aware and very thoughtful people. And, and it leads me to believe that they're gonna make good decisions. And so there is hope that they can save it. I've met him, which, which is really lucky for me, but he has met me, which he should also feel lucky because I'm trying to do everything I can to save him. If I'm alive, I would keep him alive. This is what I would do and I will move towards that. You know, I've heard of these experiments. I take a class of 20 kids who are third grade and they, they kind of randomly say 10 of them that you guys are special. You go in the advanced math class and they turn out to be really good at math uh, because someone chose them. And I have a professor from, from college who has an amazing record in choosing people who end up becoming enormously successful. And the question is, is he really good at picking people who are enormously successful, or is it the fact that you were chosen by this person that gives the kid, in this case, or the man, the confidence? And look, I, I don't view my situation as me having done a ton for Oliver. I feel like it's absolutely, uh, you've done a ton for me. People often tell me I, I'm so lucky. I have a friend who tells me I have a golden horseshoe up my ass. And, uh, but I, but I, you know, it's, 
Yeah, I've never understood why Bill picked me. I don't know what he saw in me, because I, I don't think that I saw it at the time, right? Yeah. Young and cocky and, and ignorant and, and all of those things, and, you know, for him to be able to pluck me out of Tierra del Fuego at 25 and, and put me on the path that I'm on now, yeah, I, I'm, you know, you know, forever grateful for that. Wait till those wolves make night.